Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and before I start this video, um, which I'm going to be talking about basket hilts, I'd like to say that it's dedicated to a really good friend of mine and um, a founder, in fact, a founding member of Scholar Gladiatoria by the name of Ross Dean. Um, any of you who were um, in the very early days of, of HEMA in Europe, so around the year 1999, 2001, 2002, um, Ross was uh, in those days working with Chris Webb on a company called Countercut, importing swords from Angus Trim and other companies into the UK and he came to quite a number of HEMA events and any of, of you who were obviously a member of Scholar Gladiatoria um, at that time in those very early days, in fact at our beginning, at our very absolute beginning, um, will remember Ross fondly. He was a great guy and sadly I found out uh, today, this morning in fact, um, that sadly he's passed away. So uh, Ross, this is for you. Um, I'll remember you incredibly fondly. You were very important um, in the early days of my personal experience of HEMA and you were a great guy. So one of Ross's loves, uh, he was born in Glasgow. He actually lived in Devon um, when I knew him anyway and, uh, and in fact until the end of his life. But he was from Glasgow and one of his loves being from Glasgow was basket hilted swords. I'm just going to talk a little bit about basket hilted swords. Some of you will have heard some of the things I'm saying before but for some of you this may be new information. So first of all, what is a basket hilted sword? Well you can see I'm holding one here. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap over swords to the beginning of the story. Okay, so this is Lucy's sword. In fact, this is a replica, um, or at least the hilt is a replica of the Mary Rose sword. Now, Mary Rose was Henry VIII's flagship, which sunk in 1545. Therefore, this hilt, this style of hilt, is very specifically datable to 1545 or earlier. And really in the history of basket hilts, that's incredibly early. What's amazing is that such a developed form of basket should have been available to people in 1545. And also there's a perception, certainly in the Victorian period, and th I think through, through into modern times as well, that this style of basket hilt that goes fully around the hand is a sort of Scottish and Irish thing. And of course, ironically, one of the earliest datable examples we have is English. Not to say that, of course, the person who owned that sword and, and probably died on Henry VIII's ship, Mary Rose, in 1545, he may have been Scottish or Irish. In fact, there's no, there's no, uh, nothing to say for sure that, that he was an Englishman. But um, absolutely the earliest datable find, therefore, is from Portsmouth um, in England, or just off the coast of England in the sea, um, from 1545. But that's not to say that basket hilts only came around in the British Isles. Um, there were basket hilts in Germany and other areas of Europe. Um, German basket hilts seem to be pretty much almost as early as British ones. So, but they're different, they're a different design. Uh, they do fully encase the hand, or at least um, the developed ones do, um, but they aren't, they don't do it in the same way with the same arrangement of bars. So rather than necessarily it being invented in one place and uh, copied, so for example, let's say it was invented in England in 1530-ish, um, the Germans didn't just copy it because the German style basket hilts are quite different to the um, British, shall we say, style basket hilts. Um, so therefore, why do we get these basket hilts coming around in, let's say, the second quarter of the 16th century? I think it's probably safe to say that if we've got one sinking with the Mary Rose in 1545, they'd probably been around for at least 10 years prior. Um, especially given how developed this basket hilt is and how similar it is to later ones uh, from the later 1500s and indeed after 1600 as well. Um, one thing we have to note about this basket is it is asymmetrical. So unlike with the later Highland basket hilts we see, which are symmetrical usually, sometimes they have a, a hole for the reins of, to hold a horse, but generally speaking, they're more or less symmetrical, and this is asymmetrical. And secondly, it still has a cross guard. So if you look at this uh, hilt for a minute and try and blank out the basket, okay, what we've essentially got is a medieval arming sword. If we just cover up that basket, we've got a cross, straight cross here with uh, terminal knobs on the end, 
as you find with 15th century English swords, and a ball pommel. I've also spoken in the past how those ball pommels are a very characteristically English feature, actually. And if we look at the um, Scottish swords, very often they have a hemispherical or some, sometimes conical pommel. Um, the English ones are spherical and you'll notice it's a massive knob um, and to make that that's not too heavy because of the size it is hollow. So there was obviously something in the English psyche that loved a massive knob uh, on the end of their swords and because they wanted a big pommel they had to make it hollow so that it wasn't balanced wrongly essentially uh, but there was obviously something in their ethos of design either the look of it or the feel of it or something that meant they wanted big round pommels uh, but coming back to the basket you'll notice that it's asymmetrical and uh, the inner guards are actually quite like a swept hilt rapier so we've got something that looks like a vestigial um, finger ring here so if you imagine the finger coming over there Possibly that could be a finger ring and then sidebars um, that are similar to the thumb bars we get on a swept hilt rapier. So it seems as if what they were doing is they were taking a swept hilt that was for a thrust centric sword and then being in Britain, the British being cut centric people, as, we, as you find out when you read George Silver, not to say they didn't thrust but they were very choppy centric people and the Germans seem to have been as well, at least the northern Germans, they've decided to fit a basket hilt which better protects against cuts. So for example, if you're using a swept hilt then uh, the forms of swept hilt protect your hand enough from cuts because you've generally got the blade forward and in front of the hand. As soon as you uh, want to hold the sword more like this, then that hilt doesn't work so great against cuts and you're better off developing some form of basket which protects the hand better. And because of angulation, assuming the other person is right-handed and I'm right-handed, if they cut to me here and I guard here, then actually this side of the guard protects the hand perfectly adequately. We only need protection for the thumb as we have there, which is why very often with sabers you'll notice as well, the guard is more accentuated on this side, whereas if we guard on this side against the cut, we need that guard there. So whether we're guarding inside or outside, we want the guard mostly on the outside. Not to say that it's not useful on the inside, of course we do get hit on the inside of the hand and the wrist sometimes, so a full basket hilt has some advantages, but it comes at a cost, but I'm going to talk about that, those costs in a minute. So we get this type of basket hilt asymmetrical that eventually becomes a symmetrical basket hilt, which we'll look at in a second. Um, in Britain by before the middle of the 16th century, which is incredibly early when we consider as late as 1500, people were still essentially using swords that looked like medieval swords. They had cross hilts, they occasionally had finger rings, they occasionally had a knuckle bow. Okay, so very occasionally you get finger ring, very occasionally you get a knuckle bow. And both of, both of those elements are incorporated into this hilt. But remember, that gives you essentially what most people would know as a side sword. Now, a side sword, which is essentially an arming sword with some additional hand protection on it, um, a side sword is a type of sword that you can find throughout the 1500s, all the way through to 1600, and in some cases beyond, without any real additional things. You, you know, finger rings, a knuckle bow, and maybe a side ring. Um, so really relatively minimal hand protection. So the fact that we're getting a fully enclosed basket by 1545, probably by 1535, is really quite an exceptional thing. So, why did people in, and this is a separate question, I have addressed this in a separate video um, in the past, rather than me saying I'm going to do a separate video, I can say I've done a separate video. Um, why did people in Germany and England develop these style of hilts at that time? Well, I think it has to be connected, first of all, to the carrying of swords in civilian life. That is, people therefore not wearing forms of hand protection. They've got vulnerable hands, so they want to protect them. But secondly, it has to be connected to the fencing systems using these swords. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of that now, but I think it's got to be connected to the fact that in England and um, Germany, there were certain guards, guard positions, and certain ways of using swords, which must have meant that basket hilts were seen as more appropriate than they were necessarily in Italy, France, and Spain. Right, 
So uh, we're going to come back now to the development. So as I've mentioned, this at some point developed away from a swept hilt on the inside and a basket hilt on the outside to the more, uh, in fact I'll grab a different one because I've got three down here so I may as well make use of all of them, to a more symmetrical basket. Now this form, this is a 19th century example in fairly rough condition as you can see made by Wilkinson in the middle of the 19th century. But what they essentially followed uh, with the Highland officer's basket hilt was a symmetrical hilt modelled on uh, what had been developed in Scotland really in the late 1600s and into the uh, 1700s. So whilst this is a 19th century sword, the hilt is very much a product of the 18th century, you could even say the late 17th century. So in the 17th century, or even in the 16th century, we start to see symmetrical baskets being formed. And you'll notice the cross guard is still there it's still inside um, the basket. It's still part of the construction and part of the design, but the basket, the guard rather, the cross guard, no longer extends beyond the basket. Now, we could get into a great, um, we could do a whole video, in fact, on why that's the case. I think, by and large, the simplest answer is because it wasn't needed anymore. You don't need to have the cross guard extending beyond the basket. And in fact, that was one of the first features to be dropped from basket hilts by about the year 1600. So about the time that George Silver and Joseph Swetnam were writing their treatises, around that time, the cross guard stops extending beyond the basket, with the exception of this little quill on at the back, and they start to trust the whole basket. Now, is there any advantage to having the cross guard extend beyond the basket? Well, in literal terms, you could say yes. I think it does help you engage opposing thrusting weapons more easily and bind against them and counter thrust. So if you've got your point forward and you're fighting someone who's using a rapier or a small sword, if you engage with them, you're more likely to get their blade um, trapped by your quill on and you're able to thrust back at them. Um, however, if you're favouring a predominantly cut-centric style and uh, you're not holding the sword in the way I just was there, but you're holding it in something closer to a handshake grip instead of a thumb-up or quill-on um, fingering style grip, which brings the point more in line, if you've got more of a canted connection between your arm and the sword, which in some ways is um, not forced, but is in some ways promoted by the basket hilt itself, then indeed um, the guard in that form engaging the person's blade and, and counter thrusting is something that perhaps you need the quillons less. However, one thing I will say, notice that even on these 19th century ones and right the way through the 18th century, we usually have these two bars. And I do think to some extent, they act as a blade trap, okay? So I think they have two main purposes. I know that uh, Paul McDonald and various other people out there have ideas about what these are for. As far as I'm aware, and please do post underneath if you know somewhat uh, contrary to this, but as far as I'm aware, no historical source explains why these two uh, bars here are retained. Um, they are like the finger ring almost and the quill on combined. Um, now I've got, I think they're there for two main reasons. Partly they're there as a trap, okay? Partly there to, for exactly what I just talked about. If you've crossed a person's blade and you counter thrust them, then um, I think you're more likely to trap uh, or bind their blade in there during the wind. But secondly, I think they're also there as a, sh not a shock absorber as such, but a, a kind of barrier to this part of the basket getting a lot of punishment. Because in this style of, uh, of broadsword play that's taking very heavy blows, a lot of the heavy blows come down there. So I think that they are there to absorb or, or block a lot of the punishment that would otherwise be directed straight at the guard. And if that guard were getting bent in, it would be impacting with your index finger, and your hand basically, inside, perhaps even your thumb. By having that there, the impacts are away, and if these get bent or broken, at least it's a bit further away from your hand. So I think, that, I think those are the two main reasons. But um, the symmetrical hilt, does it give more protection? Yes, no shadow of a doubt. Why? What is the disadvantage of having a symmetrical hilt? Well, first of all, let's, in fact, let's break that down. We'll talk about the disadvantages and advantages of a full basket hilt. So number one, 
easiest, big advantage, a huge amount of hand protection. Now, some of you go, oh, there's some gaps in there I could stick my small sword through. <laughs> well, yeah, every hilt has gaps in it, okay? My whole body's a gap as well, okay? Notice I don't have a hilt around my head or around my torso. So, yes, there are always gonna be some things exposed, but these basket hilts usually have a buff leather liner inside. So, actually, many of these, those gaps will be filled by leather. Now, leather isn't gonna stop everything, but it'll stop most things, most things involving the force of a sword anyway, um, and uh, at least remember the sword that is moving the whole time. So the whole time it's attacking and defending and doing everything else. Um, you can't specifically target little holes and put all of your exertion to trying to stab through here. When the other person is in the process of defending and uh, counter-attacking and reposting as well, okay? So remember you're fighting someone who's trying to kill you, quite possibly. Right, so, huge amount of hand protection um, to both sides, okay? Clearly the outside and the inside, whichever direction I point the hilt in, Okay, I've got huge amounts of hand protection, more than basically any other hilt invented, especially when we've got the leather liner inside. What are the disadvantages? Well, there are three main disadvantages as I see it. Number one, they're a bit of a pain to wear, okay? One of the beauties of asymmetrical hilts is if most of your protection is on the right-hand side, when you wear it at your side, it doesn't stick out and it doesn't bash into you too much. Okay, it's one of the reasons that sabre hilts are slightly asymmetrical, they extend more on one side than the other, partly because that's what's necessary, that's like the minimum necessary for hand protection in, in actual combat and fencing, but also because by having less on the inside, it goes against your body more easily. That aside, the second disadvantage is um, that it restricts hand movement to some extent. So by having the hilt all around, Okay, instead of being, if I hold this one, which has got less, less of a hilt, I can actually extend my uh, hand quite far up. Now, I know that Jay, Mass, and uh, other people have um, uh, not argued with me, but have picked me up on this point, and they are correct. You can still, I'll just switch to the other basket hilt. You can still get quite versatile um, grip on these types of swords. And in fact, you can get the thumb up just about, but that's partly facilitated for one specific reason that I'll go into in a second. Okay, so um, so you don't have to just dris, dr um, grip it with a hammer fist. You can have it with a handshake grip, with a counter grip, and you can put the thumb up. And there are indeed sources from the period which describe putting the thumb up with a basket hilt. So, so long as you've got enough space in, inside, it might not be terribly comfortable, but you can get your thumb up. I would, however, to, uh, to defend my point, bearing this in mind, this is the second disadvantage I'm listing for basket hilts, I would defend my point by saying that it's not as comfortable and it's not as versatile as something like a sabre hilt okay or a hanger hilt uh, or cutlass hilt um, because of these sidebars but I'll come back to those sidebars in a second. Thirdly, the third disadvantage to having a full basket, weight. Now don't underestimate that. When you look at the average weights of basket hilts, be they 17th century highland basket hilts or 19th century officer swords, they are heavier swords and the reason they're heavier swords is not because they've got bigger blades, they don't. The blade is about the same mass as a typical um, sabre of the period. The reason they're heavier is because they've got a huge amount more metal at the hilt, which uh, tends to bring the point of balance quite far back. Now that has two effects. Number one, you're carrying a heavy, heavier weapon. Not only wearing a heavier weapon, but you're using a heavier weapon, which means that your shoulder and other bits of your body are likely to get tired more quickly. And potentially it moves a little bit more slowly. So it's a heavier weapon with all of the disadvantages that comes with. Secondly, by having a huge amount of weight at the hilt, it, does, it has the potential to mess up the point of balance here by bringing the point of balance too close to the hand and reducing the cutting power of the blade. Therefore, to counter effect that, you usually have to make the blade a bit heavier, which makes the entire weapon heavier and makes it slower. So there are some disadvantages to sticking so much mass on the hilt of a weapon. And if we read Colonel Mary Mong's treaties, he very much argues that the best cutting swords in the world are the ones which have uh, point of balance fairly far up the blade, 
have a lot of uh, inertia at the tip and have very light hilt. For example, the Mamluk um, Shamshir or the Turkish Kilic or the Indian Tolwa. So the disadvantage of having lots of weight at the back end of the sword is it's at the back end of the sword and you're hitting someone with this end of the sword and therefore you're making a heavy weapon which isn't giving you any benefit to wounding the opponent. It's only giving you benefit to protecting your hand. Right, now coming back to those sidebars. So I mentioned that uh, one of the disadvantages was the sidebars. Now you'll notice that some versions of these, and this is an example, I'll make it focus on the hilt for you, attached to sidebars instead of at the side. So if you look at a mortuary hilt or if you look at an 18th century basket hilt, these sidebars normally come in and join here. And that prevents the hand from coming down the side of the pommel and gripping it with a dynamic grip like this. But with 19th century versions, they managed to get around this by attaching them essentially at the front of the pommel. Now that is a really, really clever adaptation that enables you to get the hand down in something closer to a sabre position, which is very good for a 19th century officer because they were using exactly the same system for these swords as they were for sabres and indeed for spadroons, so Angelo basically. So most people in, for the first half of the 19th century, were using Angelo's method, in Britain anyway, of course. Um, and uh, so therefore they were using it with this sword or a sabre or whatever, okay? So being able to use it in the same way as a sabre is quite good. It helps you to train your army and your officers and everything else. It also means if you're an English officer, as was often the case, an English person who's gone to become an officer in a Highland regiment and you now have to carry one of these. This is 71st, um, I think. Let's have a look. Uh, 70, ah, he's written somewhere and I can't see it now. Uh, 74th Highlanders, there we go. Sorry for that digression. Um, so uh, if you're an Englishman who's become an officer in a Highland regiment, you may have trained foil fencing and spadroon or sabre fencing. So if you're now posted to or join the 74th Regiment of Foot, a Highland regiment, it means that you can pick up one of these and still use it in the same way that you've trained to. So very useful in military terms. One thing I mentioned as well, other basket hilts. So I realise that most of my videos are very um, Anglo or British centric. Um, and this is, we are talking about a British style sword here. But as mentioned earlier in the video, there are other foreign types of basket hilts. One of those um, uh, I've mentioned uh, are the German basket hilts of the 16th century, which have a different hilt design to these and are very beautiful and still have cross guards and then the cross guards disappear in a very similar way, incidentally, to in Britain. Um, but they tend to have different shaped pommels and different arrangement of bars. Um, but equally, another very famous type of basket hilt is the Schiavona. Uh, that is an Italian basket hilt to an extent in that it was brought in by the uh, Slavic mercenaries fighting for Venice mostly, or the northern states, in the 16th century. So those people from essentially Serbia and the Balkans who came into Italy to fight as mercenaries brought a type of basket hilt sword with them. So they had a type of basket hilt just like the Germans did, and the northern Germans, and just like the English did and the Scottish and the Irish. Uh, but it was a different design yet again. Now, what's interesting about the Schiavona is that the bars, the side bars, connect at the front. They, in fact, don't really connect at all. They come in front of the pommel, which enables you, and in fact, they still have finger rings inside, to get this type of dynamic um, point extended grip more easily than the earlier British examples, such as the mortuary hilt and the early Highland basket hilts do, where the bars connect at the side. Um, Right, so I'm going to finish off uh, more or less there, I think, but hopefully that was an overview of basket hilts. Basket hilts seem to have been particular to certain areas, as mentioned, all of the British Isles, England, Scotland, um, Ireland and Wales, um, and they were popular in northern Germany, northern and central Germany, and they were popular in, um, in uh, what became uh, the former Yugoslavia, um, and therefore the, the mercenaries carried those into northern Italy as well. So there were basket hilted cut and thrust swords or broadswords, should we say, back swords and broadswords, were popular in several different areas and that must be connected to the particular requirements of those people in that time and the way that they used their swords. Um, there are some disadvantages to these. They're heavier, they sometimes limit hand mobility um, and uh, they're a bit more difficult to wear and things like this. Um, and um, 
But that being said, they come with many advantages. The main one being a huge level of hand protection, um, but also, and it shouldn't be overstated, the fact that they are symmetrical, the later ones are symmetrical, and a symmetrical guard uh, means that the sword's less likely to turn in the hand when you're moving it around. Asymmetrical guards have a habit of turning in the hand. Um, and there we go, once again to say, basket hilts, very, very interesting form of sword. They don't get as much attention as they probably should do, but some people out there like Jay, um, uh, Jay Mas in uh, Canada, are working on the, the use of these, the specific use of these. There's also uh, Heiko over in Germany as well. There's various people out there who are working on basket hilt sources. 18th century sources in particular need more love. Not just basket hilted broadswords and backswords, but also the small sword, the spadroon, and so on. Um, and once again, to say uh, this is dedicated to Rostein, um, I'm going to miss you. And I'm really glad that we uh, reconnected a bit um, a year or two ago and um, managed to catch up and I'm glad that you had a, uh, a happy and good life. Uh, condolences to family and friends. Um, he is going to be really missed. He was a great guy. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.